Hi, I'm Russ Livesay. This is a review of some basic principles of charring. The purpose of this is to understand some of the fire forensic tools that can be used for identifying fire origins in investigation. We're going to focus strictly on charring and lost material. Today is April 29th, 2024. And I think one important principle that drives this is this, it's almost like a moral compass points in a given direction. You have a real sense of mission for forensic investigation. An example was Cameron Todd Willingham, who was executed in 2004 for a crime that really never happened. Fire investigators concluded arson was involved in a 1991 fire, but modern forensics that utilize science and engineering principles have verified that there probably wasn't any arson involved with this fire. The question from that Texas case is how can we change things focusing more on engineering and science to ensure uh, you know, false litigation, even criminal convictions like Mr. Willingham can't happen again. So charred material is likely to be found in nearly all structural fires, and this gives an impetus to focus on char as a forensic tool in analyzing problems. Um, charring can have various uh, rates. So what you can conclude, conclude is that charring um, for uh, where empirical data is collected from laboratory tests, those charred depths and the times to achieve those depths can be replicated in real fires if the conditions for the fire are firmly understood. Typically, uh, at least the standard fire, standard fire is defined as an ASTM E119 fire test. So that's a, a heating profile that materials are tested to. And if you apply that test, you can typically come with a range for char depth of 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 millimeters a minute. And there's ways to formulate and correl correlate the ASTM E119 fire test with real world type applications. One involves the, the very nature of an ASTM E119 test is that it's, it's not steady state. So there's some formulas you can use to correlate the, the ASTM E119 furnace test to um, more of a steady state application. So looking at the Q average here, uh, this is a heat flux, and you can obtain an average for a given duration of the ASTM E119 furnace test, and then apply that into a formula to determine time that results in a certain char thickness. But the reality is you can conclude that char depth is going to be effectively proportional to actual accumulated energy transfer over time. And you can use that as a tool because depth of char may not be the most reliable uh, metric to be able to calculate fire time. But what it can be used for is establishing an origin, identifying where an origin comes from. So relative depth of char is the key to show the direction of fire spread. Uh, now you might, let's use an example. Let's say you have a relocatable power tap. That's an octopus plug with portable electric heater plugged into it. And it's adjacent to some cardboard related ash, which is adjacent to what seems to be uh, you know, a sofa that was ignited. You did a char profile that showed the greatest depth of char near that chair you know that chair produced significant more overall heat or energy that was transferred into the wood than other locations. And looking in the vicinity of that chair, you can identify that relocatable power tap that was overloaded, resulting in your efficient source. That's the method that can be used with char to diagnose where fire origin occurred. Um, so when fire patterns are not visually obvious, you can use depth of char in terms of a survey, almost a map, to help identify where that origin occurred. Now this is a caliper, it's a standard caliper used for these kind of analyses, and there's a probe on the back end that allows you to set or to probe into the char. The char is kind of weak, you can actually penetrate it by applying a little bit of pressure with a probe pole. And here's an example of demonstrating just that from NFP 921. Uh, char depth is actually measured 
not from the cracks that develop. Uh, char shrinks as it forms and it develops cracks and blisters. Look for the solid char in performing this uh, depth analysis. Um, Comparison of char measurements should be done only for identical materials. So clearly you can have different materials such as, uh, let's say there's oak, there's pine, let's say you even have some paneling. Um, different materials are going to char at different rates. Uh, moisture content is another factor that needs to be considered. So if you're going to do a depth of char analysis, it has to be the same kind of material. So some other factors that can affect char depth, um, you could be located next to a ventilation source. As stated previously, the ASTM E119 standard fire furnace, um, you know, the, the actual products of combustion in that furnace are roughly 10%. So when you look at char rates for a normal 21%, which is equivalent to 23% by mass, 21% by volume, it's 23% by mass and atmosphere, oxygen content. When you look at localized regions adjacent to ventilation sources that are producing higher concentrations of oxygen, that's going to char faster. You can have um, potentially more depth of burn or material losses. Um, keep in mind too, the richer your mixture, uh, the more products of combustion are going to have um, incomplete products of combustion, which is carbon monoxide. The char is, you're going to have thicker depths of char where you don't have oxygen. Thicker or more oxygen is going to have a cleaner burn. It, it may be more deeply penetrate into the wood. But at the same time, you may not have as much residual or leftover charcoal there because of uh, a lack of oxygen, pyrolysis effect involved in that. Uh, so here's an example of a room. You can see the interesting blistering differences. Past forensic so-called experts have suggested that the differences in blistering may be accounted for by accelerants, and that's simply not the case. Uh, here's a room from a fire test, um, homogeneous uh, wall uh, surfacing. It clearly shows differences that cannot be attributed to uh, liquid accelerants. So blistering cannot be used as a tool or means of almost a, a binary pass-fail where accelerants used or not. You can't do that, but what you can do is you can take the char depth analysis previously discussed. So here's an example of a contour map from a room similar to this where the gridded pattern of a one foot, one foot squares were used to take measurements from and then those measurements plotted on a graph, a color coordinated graph. Shown here on the right is a map that shows the uh, colors as a function of depth. And if you look at the black and the red location, which is adjacent to the door, uh, that door being on the left, that, that, that seems to indicate the highest amount of energy was transferred in this location. So during further analysis, what uh, an investigator should do is go and look and see, well, hey, what could have created the additional energy transferred here. Uh, was this a ventilation effect because of the door exclusively? Uh, it, it may have been, but probably not in this case. You had another uh, you know, source of combustibles adjacent it, to it that ignited, burned vigorously, and um, allowed for vigorous charring at this particular look. Um, in some events, you're obviously not going to have uh, wood interior finish. You're usually going to have gypsum, sheetrock, but what you can realize is that sheetrock is going to have a specific heat transfer through it that's going to affect the interior wood studs behind that sheetrock wall. So here's an example where you do have a wall stud, uh, drywalls on one side of it, but because of the heat transfer going into that uh, gypsum, you're going to have some transfer to the wood stud. And if left long enough, you're going to have char, uh, charring in, on that interior surface of the 2x4 or 2x6 stud. So here's an example that shows two by four studs, uh, previously gypsum wall, uh, clearly some depth there. And what you can realize is your studs, the deposition or the removal or creation, I should say, of char, it's going to be a function of, once again, your heat transfer into it. So the closer you are to the heat source, the more charcoal or charring you're going to have associated from that fire. The similar principle can be applied to floor, fire, floor fires. Uh, you can isolate just based on char deposition um, or creation, I should say, on your floor joists under the, the subfloor where the fire could have been. And you trace back uh, through uh, basically depth of char to identify, well, where did the fire actually happen? Uh, flammable gas leaks also can be used or diagnosed from this method. If you have a gas leak, let's say you have a natural gas leak home or some kind of an apartment, 
um, it ignites as a flash fire. Flash fires typically are not going to create char of any depth, but what you will have is greater char at the point of origin. For so if you have a ruptured line of some sort, there's going to be residual gas that's going to continue being emitted from that pipe after the explosion. And that's going to have localized charring whose depth is going to be significantly deeper when compared to the rest of the facility. So you can isolate where the leak occurred through this mechanism. Uh, another location of charring differences is going to be at the door interfaces. Um, a door that separates a cold and a hot area uh, is obviously going to have leaks associated with the space under a door or around its threshold, uh, as well as around um, the door frame itself. And you can use that to identify well, patterns. You have a lot more, and there's variables, let's be clear, there's variables in terms of how long the fire is going, uh, pressure differentials, things like that, that's going to result in greater ventilation. But the real takeaway is if you have adequate heat, you have ventilation affecting that localized region of heat, you're going to have greater char depth. Use this to your advantage in diagnosing areas of uh, potential where, where fire uh, moved to or originated from. Uh, one other concept that needs to be considered uh, regarding this principle is the effects of manual firefighting operations and overhaul operations. When a firefighter is going to go into a room post flashover, let's say, and put out a fire, um, the whole process of having a you know a fog or even a hose stream, it's going to knock off forensic evidence. It's going to damage charcoal. It's going to damage uh, smoke patterns. So keep that in mind. Uh, here's an example, an image that shows um, how uh, suppression, active manual suppression activities from a fire hose have changed the profile of smoke patterns on this wall. So it's an important concept to keep in mind. Additional things to be considered uh, to consider on this, here are different class A or type A and B uh, fires. Uh, you have some liquid accelerants um, on the left side. Uh, right side, you have uh, Class A type materials, cardboard, plastic, uh, polyurethane foam, uh, on different substrates. And what this demonstrates is there are some burn patterns associated with these topics, but it's, it's easy to be deceived. Uh, for instance, here's an example of an actual burned building. No accelerants were used, but analysis of the floor could allow an untrained eye to conclude that accelerants were used. They were not used in this case. Here's an example of a laminate flooring where you had a cardboard box placed on top of it. Uh, you could conclude that there were uh, some kind of a liquid pool or something along those lines that created this. That's simply not the case. So observation alone is insufficient to arrive at an appropriate con uh, conclusion. Here's an example of a carpeted floor where a test was done with some liquid accelerant. And it creates this donut-shaped charcoal where the middle is cooled via evaporation of that liquid, whereas the perimeter around this pool shows deeper char. And that suggests a liquid accelerant. But in all these previous cases, what it comes down to is additional laboratory test is necessary. Uh, you, you can't conclude from any of these images um, perhaps this one is pretty obvious, but other images, it's really challenging to conclude that a liquid accelerant was used. Laboratory analysis through sampling will conclude that. So it's vital that those kind of samples are performed this kind of analysis. Uh, so keep in mind, char, char irregularities can come from several different effects. You have moisture content, ventilation, furnishings and fixtures. Um, furnishings and fixtures... Um, a fixture could easily block radiant heat flux and consequently shield an area. And during overhaul that the fire department does when they go in and remove things, clean up, make sure there's no continuing smoldering fires, they're going to move those kind of things around. So it's very important that we recognize where things are um, at the time of fire. Uh, so be careful on conclusions. Uh, char depth, you know, it can be caused by increased ventilation. Um, Identifying an area of or, uh, origin simply because of the degree of damage has led to false conclusions. It's dangerous to go that way. Uh, the laws of radiative energy transfer are time, distance, and shielding. Those are the fundamental rules that should be considered. They're valuable in our analysis. So the conclusion is char depth cannot be used to determine time of fire unless you fully understand the, the various conditions of that fire. 
if you can correlate it to an ASTM furnace fire, then there is value in performing an analysis, estimating time. But it's, there's so many variables in there. It's, it's a very dirty way of estimating fire. Charring has multiple variables that affect depth. So be very cautious when you're analyzing depth and correlating that with an origin. Make sure you look around to identify was there a door, a vent, window that could have contributed to greater ventilation. What was the moisture content in that area? Uh, what was the type and species of, of wood there, for instance? Uh, all these factors need to be considered. Need to be uh, documented that they were considered in terms of any kind of analysis. Uh, the reality is the best use of charging is for mapping the depth of charred various locations. What that does is it creates contours that point to an origin. That helps us identify general vicinity where the fire started. And then we can do further analysis in terms of well, what was the actual ignition. So that's the process of using these tools. Charring can be a powerful tool if we're smart about it, um, but we have to do our forensic analysis appropriately. Uh, here are some references that were used for this analysis. Thank you for your time.